My name is Adam MacArthur. I'm just going round two with this. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And that, that now it makes sense why everyone just stared at me uh, blankly. All right. We've got, I like to point out to the, the banner. So we've got the Encountering Jesus series that's happening right now. And um, like I was saying, here is why I'm really excited about it. You guys have, have heard me say this before. I, I love the, the uniqueness in, in the way that God creates each one of us. And, and part of that uniqueness that I love is because we, in, we interpret things differently or we see things differently. And, uh, and I've loved being able to hear from everybody during the Encountering Jesus series because it's, I, I think of Nicole Hunter and the way that she approached this, the death of Lazarus with Jesus and Mary and Martha. And I just realized I, I never would have come to that conclusion. I never would have seen it that way. And so it's been really beautiful to hear how other people uh, were, were seeing that. So this morning, if you would, open up your, your Bibles. Uh, we're going to Matthew eleven twenty eight, or turn on your phones. Uh, fair warning, I do know what the Pokemon Go notification sounds like. And so I'm going to ask you just to chill on the hunt this morning. Uh, unless you find Charmander, and then if you've got to stand up and, and go for it, then, uh, then you can. I just know that there's seven people who know what Pokemon in his here now. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good way to gauge the audience. Okay. Uh, so I w- I'd like to read this. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I have, I've been in this verse now for, uh, for a little while. And what that means to me is that uh, when I ask God, like, what, what is it that you're trying to show me in my life right now? He, he, he continues to, to bring up Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And so I, I'm praying through it and I'm singing it and I'm meditating on it. And, and that just continuously comes up over and over and over again. And I had a, a really great teaching for you guys uh, on this verse uh, and, and, and then a week ago. Uh, it, it all got hijacked, um, and, it, and, and God had something very real, very now to, to reveal to me in this, and I'm less going to, to, to teach this morning and more kind of out loud process and bear my soul with where I'm, I'm currently at. And, and, uh, and, and in this series, in the Encountering Jesus series, uh, we, we, we start with John, and he, and he has the encounter with Jesus in the ship, and then you have Jesus either talking to a single person or a couple people, and I'm going to throw a wrench in that this morning, uh, because this scripture is not Jesus speaking to a single person or, or, or a couple of people, and I, what I want to say is this, is this is Jesus right now talking to us in this room currently in this moment, and I, I cannot help but think about a Matthew 11:28. Um, without remembering a, a story. So I have this incredible gift. I mean, it's so, so spot on, so acute, so honed in. Um, and, and that gift is to put myself in the middle of awkward situations, like cringeworthy awkward situations that you wish you didn't know me or weren't my friend when I was there, awkward situations. And so Taryn and I, my wife, we, were, uh, we were, had two kids at home. We had um, just we got, had a new house that was part of this ministry that we were in. And apparently when you, when you get a house, you're supposed to put blinds on all the windows. We, we didn't know that. You're not supposed to have people be able to look in. So we had to call a guy who was going to come out and, and put blinds on the windows. And we had, we had heard that a couple other people had used this guy. His name was Mark, really nice guy. We heard, found out that he was a believer. And so Mark came over to our house. And was sitting down and, and discussing things about, about blinds and, and drapes and all kinds of stuff. And in my incredibly gifted, awkward fashion, I knew something was wrong with Mark. I could tell something was just off with him. And so uh, I, I interrupted his sentence when he was talking about something and said, Hey, are you, are you okay? And he was kind of taken aback and looked at me and said, You know what? No, actually, I'm not okay. I'm having a, a really hard hard thing I'm going through. And I said, well, do you mind like sharing it with us? And he said, yeah, I, yeah, I, um, my, my, my kiddo ran away. And I was like, oh gosh, you know, I've got, uh, Enoch is, is almost two, Jaron's a baby. Uh, and I'm thinking, wow, like this is really, really serious. And he said, yeah, he said, I, I don't know where she went. Um, uh, th- this has happened a couple of times in the past, but, uh, but, but she left and she hasn't been back now. 
And I said, do you, do you mind if, if, if Tara and I pray for you? And he's like, yeah, I don't mind at all. And so I um, said, okay, Jesus, I'm, I'm coming to you right now with my brother Mark. He's got burdens that he's carrying right now. And, and we need you to lift those burdens. And I, I began to pray for him and that, that the Lord would, would, would go and find his daughter. Lord, would you, would you find his daughter? You know where she's at right now. Would you go get her? Would you bring her back? And, and Taryn grabs a hold of my leg, and, and I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm that man. Uh, you made the right choice. I'm praying for people. Like, I'm leading my family spiritually. My wife is proud. There's a stranger at my table. Like, I know I'm doing everything right right now. And so I continue to pray and say, uh, Father, would, would, you, would you know where she's at right now? You created her. You made her. You know what makes her tick. What is happening? Right? And Taryn begins to really squeeze my leg, and I'm thinking, yeah, all right. Like, she's into this prayer. Like, this is my man, and my man's praying. And so I take that as a signal to keep going, baby. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep going, baby. So I start really, I mean, this, we're living in the South, so I start really ramping the prayer up, you know, Southern style. So I begin to really pray like, Lord, I don't know where, this, where she's at right now, but we know that you do, and you know exactly where she's at, and you can, you can find her right now. We ask that you would bring her back to him. And Taryn just starts squeezing my leg, and I'm like, I don't know how to pray any more than I'm praying. And I'm just going for it. And I, in the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. And I expect to look over at my wife, who is so wowed by my obvious uh, spiritual guidance of our family, and that loving look into her eyes where she said, I made the right choice. And that wasn't the look that she gave me. Um, the look was, oh, maybe my mom was right. <laughs> and it really, it really threw me off, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm looking at her, and, and it's that, like, I made a vow that we're in this thing, so I guess we are, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to lock eyes with you. and I'm just going to continue to look at you. I can't figure out like what's going on. And, and I look over at Mark and I expect to just see tears running down his face. And like, thank you, dear brother. You just entered in and heaven's moved and I'm sure she's home. And Mark just is looking at me like, huh. and I'm like, what? What? The whole like squeezing the leg. Like I thought we were in the moment. And Mark turns to me and says, oh, thank you. Uh, but kiddo is my cat. And I'm, and I'm reeling. I'm like, what? The cat? Like that, how, where, where, at what point in time were you telling the story about this? And I totally missed that you were talking about your cat. And why is your cat doing drugs and lost on the streets? And, and it's super awkward. And he goes, you know, maybe she really needs prayer. And I'm like, oh, let's just not try. And... And so Mark goes, well, should we measure windows? And I said, yeah, let's just measure the windows. So anyway, I don't really know how to transition from that, so I'm going to pray. <laughs> and not for cats. That's a, yeah, cats will be after this. Well, definitely, anybody who has a cat that's run away, I'll be an H2. So <laughs> uh, Jesus, uh, you're welcome for that one. I'm sure that, that all of heaven loved that. Uh, thank you this morning for this beautiful body of people and we are collectively carrying burdens. We each walk in here carrying things from the weight of this world and, and our individual lives, and you're the only one who knows, who sees our hearts, knows our hearts. And so I'm asking this morning, Jesus, would you meet each person with that invitation of come to me? Would you meet each person where they're at and lift burdens this morning and give us rest? In your mighty name, I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so I, like I said, a lot of this for me is, is working this out in front of you guys. Um, you see, a week ago I thought I had a teaching and everything changed and I'm now at a place right standing before you where things are incredibly hard, incredibly, incredibly hard in my life and I'm going to get into that. And so there's this verse of come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And what I have come to realize in this last week is that I, I always thought about this scripture in a certain way and realized that I was actually viewing it wrong. And when I, when I realized what was being said here, it's, it's changed a lot for me, and so I, I want to talk through that. You see, Jewish, uh, Jesus is a, is a Jewish rabbi, 
And Jesus, the Jewish rabbi, has Jewish disciples. And Jesus and his disciples are living in a Jewish first century culture. And in this culture, probably in an area known as Galilee, in, in, in this area, that, that, that they have this historical figure that we know as, as Moses. And Moses gives them the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the Torah is, it, it, it's not just books of the Bible, it's their entire way of life. I mean, th this is what guides them and how they live, how they walk their life out. It is everything to them. And not only is it the foundation of their life, but it's actually also the foundation of their school system. And so around six years old, children will begin to, to go to school. They're going to go to, to, to learn about the Torah. And this is going to be taught at a, at a synagogue with, with a Torah teacher who is a rabbi. And so this first part of school is called Beit Sefer. And what will happen is kids will, will learn the Torah from a, the age of 6 to about 10 years old. And in this time, they're going to leave actually having the Torah memorized. Every part of it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. And at this stage, what will happen with most of them is they, they will actually then go on to the, learn the family trade. If they're a family or fisherman, or learn how to, to run a household. They're all going to then begin to apprentice under either mom, dad, or an aunt or uncle. But the best of the best are going to move on. And this next part this, of, of school is called, is called Beit Talmud. And in this next part of their schooling, this is, this is going to go to, on average, around the age of 14 years old. And they're actually going to learn the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. So this is Genesis through Malachi, and they're going to come out with that memorized. I mean, this is everything to them. And so Genesis through Malachi memorized. And from that group, a lot of them are then going to go in again back into, the, into their, their family trade. If they were able to make that cut, they're now going to go into the family trade. But there's the best of the best of the best, this next group who makes it. And this group who makes it is actually going to go to a rabbi and apply to be that rabbi's disciple. Now, disciple for us is a very different word. Disciple for us is, is more along the lines of, hey, I need you to guide me. I kind of know what you know a little bit, but I want you to check in with me every once in a while, make sure that I'm going the right way, and maybe I'll ask you some questions. But it's incredibly different in the Hebrew culture. You see, the, the rabbi is, is, is everything, everything. And so what they're doing when they're asking to, to apply to be this rabbi's disciple is they want to follow him, be like him, do everything that he does because, because they have this understanding that this is like the most important man in, in their culture. And so what happens when they, when they come to apply to this rabbi, you see these rabbis all have a different understanding an interpretation of the scriptures. So they're going to interpret maybe the laws and, and, and the decrees in one way, but this rabbi over here is going to say, yeah, I, I, I kind of see it a little bit different. And the way that a rabbi interprets the scriptures and then walks that out is called his yoke. His yoke. And a rabbi wants his yoke to progress to get bigger, to get wider, more influence. And so he's vetting these people who are applying for discipleship. And it's rigorous, and it's incredibly difficult. And he's asking them questions, and he's grilling them, and he's talking to them about their, their oratory skills, and he's debating back and forth. Because what he's trying to find out is, do they have what it takes to actually advance my yoke? And the moment that they don't, then this rabbi will say to him, you need to go learn the family business. But the one thing that the disciple is waiting to hear from that rabbi is take my yoke upon you. And so if we can put this in the message, I want to, with that understanding, read it again. And this is the way that it's said in the message. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. 
and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus, in this moment, is inviting this group of people to come to him and take his yoke upon him. You guys, these are his disciples, those around him who were already tradesmen. These are people who are out that are listening to him. You know what this means? These are all the people who didn't make the cut. These are all the people who did not have what it took. And in the, it, with the rabbi, you are applying to be that rabbi's disciple and giving everything you can, hoping that you get a chance. And here's Jesus with this upside-down kingdom, flipping the whole thing around and going, no, 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 you, you come to me. And this yoke, it isn't what you know or what you've done or what you've been able to memorize or the way that you've used something. It's easy, and it's light because it's created for you. I'm not going to put these heavy things on you that ill fit you but come keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly and so a week ago when I began to prepare this teaching it looked very different and it was going a certain direction and then within the last week Jesus has just rearranged all that and that rearrangement has me right now in front of you having to be incredibly honest. My life is really hard. Like really, really hard. I mean everything for me is at a fever pitch. My relationship with my wife, my, my parenting with my children, my relationships with friends, my job, everything is, is crescendoed. It is, it, is, it is so intense. And I cannot stand up here and do that teaching that I was going to do. I can't. I have to tell you that I feel a ton of shame and it's really difficult. And the beauty of it is, is that Jesus is asking, are you tired or worn out? Come to me. And I want to tell you what this looks like for me and if we can do that first slide. This is what happens with me. The moment that things don't go as planned, I go into failure mode. I begin to instantly assume I need to do more, work harder, go faster, force outcomes, outsmart, self-protect and make sure. And here's the reason why. Because I'm terrified. I'm terrified that even though I know it doesn't work, if I trust it, I, I'm scared of him trust, having the outcome fully. I'm terrified to trust Jesus with my outcomes. I'm terrified to trust Jesus with my marriage. I'm terrified to trust Jesus with my children, with my relationships, with my friends. I'm terrified to trust Jesus in my job, and my career. I'm terrified. So what I do is I continuously try harder, faster, push more, and I find myself praying prayers like, Jesus, will you enlarge my capacity? I just, if I could just do a little bit more than I think I can handle everything right now. If I, if I just had an ability to do just a little bit more, I'm pretty sure I can handle my life right now. And I pray these kinds of prayers. And it's not working. And again, I, I've heard these truths for years and I believe them and know them to be true but I continuously find myself trying to do more. And this is what happened a week ago. And Jesus wanted to show me rest. And if you put up the next slide, this is what I've realized. That rest isn't a last resort. It isn't something we visit when convenient. It isn't a way to recharge and try again alone. It is a state. Rest is a constant awareness of oneness with Christ. It is waiting, listening, and trusting that Christ in me is able to respond to every situation. And so I find myself at the end of a day in my bed in tears because I'm, I'm so sad at the way that I walked that day out. I'm so sad that I powered up on my wife and tried to put her in her place so that I wasn't going to be exposed and feel shame. I'm sad that I got frustrated with my children. 
I'm sad that I talked to a coworker in a way because I know that they were getting close to me and I didn't want them to get close because if they get close then they get to see all the ugly and so I'd say something to push them away and I get so sad and I lay in bed and I think tomorrow we're going to do it different, Adam. Tomorrow it's going to be different. You're going to wake up. You're going to be happy. You're going to be excited to see everybody. You're going to compliment your wife. You're going to start working out. You know, that happens sometimes. And I go through this, this whole process. And the next morning comes, and I wake up, and, and I have these beautiful children that come into my bed, and, and they're excited to see me because they love their dad. And they all start talking at one time, and I'm trying to figure out how to love this one and love that one and what this one's saying. And, and I think that this one has, is eating peanut butter toast, and I'm really going to hate that later when I try to go to bed tonight. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm trying, and my wife comes in, and she is asking me a question, and everybody's talking at one time, and the dog's trying to lick my arm, and it's weird, and, and everything is going on. And, I, and I'm trying to remember what I said, and then I finally find myself going, everybody just stop! Stop! And I'm there. I'm right back in that same exact spot that I told myself I wasn't going to be in the night before, minus the working out part. And, I'm, and I'm, I can't believe it. I've done it. And the shame hits. And I see these, these kids who just love their dad start to walk out, and, and everyone kind of doesn't know how to really be around me at that point in time. And, and I get filled with anger because I'm so frustrated because, Adam, you just... I mean, man, it's been like eight hours. Come on. You've got to be able to figure this out. And what I do is I finally go to Jesus. And I go, I'm, I can't do it. The shame, the guilt, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. And because he's so gentle and so kind, he draws me to him. And I begin to get recharged but the moment that I feel like I've been recharged and I actually have maybe enough capacity to try it again, I'm off. All right, good. I'm going to do 12 push-ups, and then I'm going to go start talking to my kids really nice. And so I try to do that. And then I fail at it again, and I find myself in this repeated pattern. And if we could put the message up, Ed, this is, this is what I'm, I've learned that Jesus is saying to me. He's saying, Adam. Walk with me and work with me. Be like me. I can show you how to do this. I can show you how to love them. I can show you how to do all this. And it's an unforced rhythm of grace. And what I am living in is a repeated pattern of a forced rhythm of work. If I can just do a little bit more, have a little bit more capacity. But this beautiful man, this Jewish rabbi, they're saying, I'm going to turn the whole thing around upside down. It's going to be different. And I'm going to give you my yoke. And my yoke says, Adam, you can do it. That you are the perfect husband for that woman. That you're the perfect father for those kids. That you're the perfect friend. That, that's who you are. And it's so hard to believe. If we can do the third one. But this is it. Jesus will always give us the invitation first. He will not demand that we come. He will not force us to. He will not guilt trip us. He will not passively remind us that he did what he did for us and suggest we return the favor. He simply shows us what is available and then waits. And it's up to us to dare to trust and take steps, take the steps towards him. And this played out with my son, Enoch. Uh, I have three sons, and I uh, was in a hard time with, with Taryn. Uh, just in our marriage, we were working things out, and Mother's Day came up along, and I wanted to do something for her. And, and, and I said, you know, what, what, what would really, like, really do it for you? Like, what, what, what do you want to, I know you probably want to take, like, a three-year break, but I don't think I can pull that off. But what, what could I do? And she said, I just, I just want to be known. Ooh. Like, perfect woman answer. Let's just be honest. So I'm like, I can't call any of my buddies and be like, hey, my wife wants to be known. What do I do? Like, they're going to be, just send me like beers and a sorry note. You know, that's, uh, good, good, good luck. And so I'm like, oh, great. I just want to be known. Like, ah, uh, okay. Well, the Lord is, is very good. So he reminds me that like three or four years ago, uh, Taryn had really wanted this uh, above ground um, 
planter to be able to, to put some, some uh, uh, tomatoes and whatever else you want. I mean, me and the boys are going to build an above ground planter. So I've got three sons. I've got Enoch, everyone around him in about a five mile radius, and he just absorbs it into his body. Uh, and that just makes Ethan just shake and gyrate, and he's so excited. And so he's shaking, and we're talking about it. And the more we talk about it, I realize that Ethan's out. He's just going to sit there and shake the entire time at the excitement of what we're going to do. So I've lost one. Jaron, on the other hand, is, is just overly, overly smart. And so Jaron, I know I'm going to have for probably about two or three minutes. And Jaron was in for that two or three minutes until he all of a sudden realized, what if we were to take this planner and actually invert it, which I don't know how he knows that word, and then we're going to hang it from a tree. And if, we, and if we ran water off of the condensation in the morning and we got some tubing and it came through, would the, would the vegetables be bigger? And I'm like, he's gone. He's just... <laughs> like reinvented hydroponics, and so I've lost him. And so it's Enoch and I. And, and God is really incredible at, at, at Enoch being uh, the one that he uses a lot uh, uh, for me. And I've prayed, if I'm in a moment, God, where you're wanting to show me something, like, let me be present. Don't let me try to, 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 to do a lesson with him. And so we get, start getting going, and I, I need these, uh, these nails to go in at an angle, because that's what the YouTube video said. So I need, uh, to, I need to, to put them in an angle, which I had to do another YouTube video to figure out how to hammer at an angle. It's harder than it looks. Um, and so we're, we're sitting there, and I, uh, I tell Enoch, hey, here's what I want to do. I want, I want to show you how, how to put this nail in at an angle, and then after that, it's all you. You can do the rest of it. And he goes, Dad, I, I, I don't need it. I know how to do it. And I was like, oh, okay. And instantly wanted to you know, do our, our little dance. And, and it, it was beautiful because the Lord had me in a moment where he's going, I'm going to show you something. So I just took a breath. And I said, Enoch, it, it, it's a little bit more difficult than it looks. So let me just show you how to hammer it in at an angle. And then you can do the rest of them. He goes, Dad, I know exactly what I'm doing. And, I, and I, I get that little boy thing of, I've got it, I've I got it figured out, I totally get it. So I, I put my, my hand on, on Enoch's shoulder and just begin to rub his back. And, and he, he hammers it in completely straight the first time. And I'm like, no, 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 we have to have it at an angle. He's like, you hammer it first straight before you know how to do the angle. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and so we keep trying, and he's trying different ways, and it's not working, and the nail's bouncing. And then he does what any good man would do in this situation, and he blames the tools. And how, how, how at nine years old he said this, but he said, Dad, I'm just so used to using a hammer that has like a square on the end as opposed to a circle. And, and, and I'm like, I, I got you the circle hammer. I get it. Sorry. <laughs> and so he's trying and trying and trying and then just comes to a spot where I know it's done. He can't do it. And he sits there and he looks at me and he goes, okay, I don't know how to do it. I said, okay. And I put my hand on his shoulder and I showed him how to do one. And it's in that moment that the Lord spoke to me. And that's his yoke. His yoke for me is easy and it's light. What he's saying to me is that, Adam, it doesn't matter how many times you've messed up. It doesn't matter that you don't know how to do it. It doesn't matter that you wake up and you feel all these things. That doesn't matter to me. It's not too late, Adam at any point in time in this process, because I was very aware of how I was feeling with Enoch right there. I was not mad at him. I was not angry at him. I was not disappointed that he didn't know how to hammer this thing in at, at an angle. I, I wasn't frustrated with him. I had none of that going on. I just loved my boy and was glad that he finally asked me for help. If we can do the message one more time. This is our invitation, you guys. from a Jewish rabbi who's saying, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And so this morning, this is what I want to ask us. What are you carrying? What are you trying to do alone? What burdens did you bring in here? And what do you need rest from?